We're so glad to see you, and we're so sad to say goodbye to Pastor Rick and Norma, and this is Pastor Rick and Norma Sutherland Day. They have been a part of this community for more years than I'm going to tell you. They have been a part of this church for 33 years, and Pastor Rick has been on this staff as a pastor for 22 years of faithful faithful, faithful ministry, and we're going to have a conversation in just a few minutes together, Pastor Rick and I are, and we're going to just talk to you about ministry and what it's been like for 22 years to have served together. The first time I got a call from you, I declined it. I hung up on you, Rick, if you remember, because I thought it was a prank, My boys and I and my daughter, we were on the trampoline together, and we were having a good time. And Rick Sutherland called and says, Brother Thomas Trask has asked us to call you. And I hung up the phone right then. Wouldn't even talk to him. So they called back. I declined the call, so they called my wife. How many of you know if you can't get through to the husband, you can always get through to the wife, you know? And so they called my wife, and that started a wonderful love story of friendship, not only with this congregation and community, but between us and Norma. Norma sent me the meanest welcome letter that you would have ever dreamed. I still have that, Norma. You can't deny it threatening that if I moved to Michigan, I would end up in a straitjacket in some sort of insane asylum. At times, I thought you were going to be right, Norma, but you have been such a delight, and for years, you served right alongside me here at this office as as my administrative assistant. I have to tell you, I trust both of you completely, implicitly, and I'm so honored to be able to say that I got to serve with Rick and Norma Sutherland. But we want to go to the Word of the Lord before we have our conversation, because there's four quick things you need to know from the Scripture as we begin this service this morning. So I'm going to ask you if you would stand with me. And if you're on our online campus today, we're asking you just to stand with us. When I was home with uh, my family, when my son had COVID, I stood for every song. I stood for all the scripture readings and um, I gave too. So you be sure and give this morning as well. And let's turn to the word of the Lord together. Timothy, you are a man of God. So run from all these evil things. Pursue righteousness and a godly life along with faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight for the true faith and hold tightly to the eternal life to which God has called you, which you have declared so well before many witnesses. And I charge you before God who gives life to all and before Jesus Christ who gave a good testimony before Pontius Pilate that you obey this command without wavering. Then no one can find fault with you from now until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. Now stop. Rick, I feel like I'm reading about you. I can't find any fault with you. I'm not going to ask Norma because I know that wouldn't be fair to you, just like asking Becky. But this passage has described your ministry. You've held tight to, tightly to the things of God. But here's what I want you to hear, Rick. For at just the right time, Christ will be revealed by heaven, by the blessed and only almighty God, the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. He alone can ever die, and he lives in light so brilliant that no human can approach him. No human eye has ever seen him, nor ever will. All honor and power to him forever and ever. Amen. Rick, normal one day, we're going to see King Jesus again. Can we give the Lord a hand of praise for that this morning? (laughs) Hallelujah. Christ is coming. He's coming again. Join with me in prayer. Our Father, we love you. We thank you that we can say goodbye, though it's painful, we can say goodbye the way we're saying goodbye to Rick and Norma in the way that we're doing because they have run a good race. They have fought a good fight. And now I ask you in the name of Jesus, would you speak to our hearts and may every eye as Rick and Norma and Becky and I in this congregation would wish, may every eye be pointed towards Christ who alone lives in that brilliant light that one day, Lord, we hope to see face to face. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. You can be seated this morning. 
One of the first conversations that Rick and I ever had was, first of all, that pastors are called to preach. Pastors are called to preach. It's part of what it means in the assemblies of God to be a minister, to be a pastor, that we're called to declare the word of the Lord. It takes two to preach. It takes not only the preacher, but it takes the people who listen to the preacher. It takes not only the preacher, but it takes the people and the preacher together who will act upon and live upon the word of the Lord. Both of us have a task to perform. Rick and I have had the task of performing well, and I'm going to miss hearing you preach and all your stories that you share with us so well. You know, you can forget a lot of things, but you never forget a story. And you're never going to forget the stories that Pastor Rick has shared with us through the years. And when a preacher is in the pulpit, when I'm standing here or Rick is standing here preaching, or whether it's Pastor Corey or Pastor Mark, whenever we're standing here preaching, it's not our job to give you what we think, it's our job to give you the word of the Lord. It's our job as accurately as we can to, to interpret and to imply, to apply the word of the Lord to the congregation. Rick, you have been so faithful to that. There's nothing more important than God. There's nothing more important than your relationship with Jesus Christ. Listening to him is more important. Listening to God's word is more important than listening to the president, listening to your husband or listening to your wife, listening to your children. Listening to God is the most important thing you're ever going to do in your life. And that's why the preaching of the Lord is so important. Martin Luther said, remember the Sabbath day by saying we should so fear and love God so as not to despise his word, nor the preaching of the gospel, but to deem it holy and willingly learn and hear the word of the Lord. Unfortunately, all too often, preachers have made the mistake of telling what they thought rather than what the word of the Lord thought, or maybe telling what the culture thought rather than what the word of the Lord thought. And sometimes the greatest sin of all that a preacher can do is to make the word of God irrelevant by the way that he preaches it. Rick, you've always made it relevant, you've always made it interesting, and you've always applied it to us, and we thank you for that. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 15, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. And then in Acts chapter 10 and 42, he commanded us, Jesus commanded us to preach the gospel to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God has appointed judge of the living and the dead. And what is the gospel but the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, that God has sent his son Jesus to take away our sins and to give us a brand new life and a fresh start in life. The second thing pastors are called to do, and Rick, I think this is really where you've excelled. You've been a great preacher, but you have excelled right here. Pastors are called to lead the church to grow more and more like Jesus Christ. We're called to make disciples, make passionate followers of Christ, as we say at Woodland. You see, the cost of being a disciple is not nearly as great as the cost of not being a disciple. The cost of non-discipleship is the most costly thing you will ever do in your life. The cost of ignoring the cross, the cost of ignoring God's call to discipleship is the biggest mistake that anyone could ever make with their life. For you see, when you become a passionate follower of Jesus Christ, God is making something out of your life. It's not that your life doesn't have value, and it's not that your life doesn't have significance, but you will never know who God has created you to be until, first of all, you've committed your life to the plan of God for you through Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It's the reason the Bible says this in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15. We will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly, and as each part does its own special work, he helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. You see, the goal of Pastor Rick's ministry is our discipleship pastor in coordinating our small group's ministry, he and Norma together, has not been statistics, it's not been numbers, it's not been how many, but it is how much is the church becoming like Jesus? How much are we ministering to one another? And not only are we ministering to each other, but that empty chair that you're so fond of telling people about is are we inviting people to fill that empty chair from our subdivisions in our community? 
The third thing that pastors are called to do is they are called to equip people for ministry. They're called to equip the church, so not just to teach them and make them somehow or another dependent upon them. We've never wanted a church that somehow or another had to be nursed. We don't mind nursing the infants in Christ, the new folks in Christ, and helping people grow, but we want people to be equipped for ministry. And you're familiar now with shape, spiritual gifts, hearts, abilities, personality, and experience. Pastor Rick has been the driving force behind that. You see, outside of these walls of this beautiful sanctuary and this beautiful campus that God has given us, outside of these walls is where Christ wants his church to grow. It's not what happens in these walls that is significant. It's what happens outside of these walls that is significant. For if we take the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, we share it with other people, and we serve them. We give them a cup of cool water. We, we tell our neighbors. We help our neighbors. If, even if we help other people at our own expense, even if we help our enemies, for this is what Jesus has told us to do, is to love our enemies as well, then we are manifesting distinctly what it means to be a passionate follower of Christ. And of course, the Bible says of pastors, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. There is a real sense that we are pastors of the church, but you are ministers of the church. Or as we say in Discovering Woodland, pastors are the administrators of the church. It's the congregation then that becomes ministers. And yet, here at Woodland, one of the things that we've required of all of our pastors is that each of us have a ministry outside the church in our community. And Rick, Norma, and you have been a model of that as well. And then finally, pastors are called to lead the church to compassionate ministry. Pastors are called to lead the church into compassionate ministry and there's where we're going to begin our conversation this morning. I want to share with you three verses real quickly before I invite Pastor Rick to come to the platform this morning. Do not insult the deaf or cause the blind to stumble. You must fear God. I am the Lord. All the joys, this is from Psalms 41, all the joys of those who are kind to the poor, the Lord rescues them when they are in trouble. And then Jesus said, if you will look with me at Luke chapter 14, when you turn to his host, when Jesus turned to his host, when you put on a luncheon or a banquet, he said, don't invite your friends, brothers, relatives, and rich neighbors, for they will invite you back, and that will be your only reward. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Then at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. Would you welcome Pastor Rick to the platform this morning? This is going to be fun. Hallelujah. God bless you. You can be seated. For those of you who wondered if I ever could preach a sermon in under 10 minutes, I just demonstrated that. <laughs> It'll be your last one. <laughs> It'll be my last one. By the way, both he and I are fully inoculated this morning, and so we're, that was our hug there. And um, by the way, that's the first hug we've had in over a year together, so I appreciate that. Rick, when, if there's anything that I can say that you have taught me, I mean, we have been best friends. We have been Paul and Silas, Paul and Barnabas. We have, we have enjoyed ministry together. But if you've taught me anything, you've taught me all about mercy and grace and forgiveness. What have you learned in pastoral ministry about the need for forgiveness and mercy and grace? Well, you know, I, I think... I think the grace and the mercy that God showed me as a sinner showed us as a couple. I think it's that mercy and that grace that we want to pass on mm -hmm. to everybody else. And we want to show it. And I think there isn't a person here sitting here today that can say, 
you know, for the grace of God, that's why I'm here. Right. And it's that love and that mercy and, and the forgiveness. You know, it's, uh, it's something that, that you want to, you want to live it. You want to live that mercy and that grace. Yeah. You have oftentimes in your sermons, I was going back through some of your messages, you've come back to that theme of forgiveness, forgiving others. You've often come back to that theme of how to forgive as well. You have, you've been really transparent with your stories and your life. But one of your big, big concerns of ministry has been relationships. It has been family relationships, parent relationships, marriages, race relationships, community relationships. How do you see this theme in your life as affecting having healthy relationships? Well, you know, I think it all starts, relationships that start with our relationship to God. Good. And when you have that relationship, there's nothing between you and God. Then you can share that there's nothing between you and other people. Mm -hmm. And it's that relationship that you want to build. You know, there's many times that I've said, Lord, how do I love this person? How do I express my love to this person? How do I express your love to this person? And it's just, it's just being like Jesus. Yeah. That's what the scripture says. We are to be like him. And when you see somebody that, you know, I mean, let's face it, all of us sometimes, we run into people that's hard to love. Mm -hmm. But Jesus never did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he's had to teach me that. And I love people because God love them too. Yeah. Now, that's easy to say. Hard to do. Hard to do. So Hard. where do you find the strength to be like Jesus? It's in because I have, there have been times when I haven't felt like being like Jesus, and I've had to come to you and say, Rick, I need you to pray for me. And there's been times I've come to you. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's the grace of God again. Yeah. It's the grace of God. You know, every once in a while, God has to remind me what he's forgiven me of. And when I realize that, then I realize God loves that person no matter what. Yeah. You know, he just didn't die for me. He also died for them. I think that's one of the most important things to, that Pastor Rick has said, and that is we all need to remember what God has forgiven us of. When we remember what God has forgiven us, there's no room for holier than thou. There's no room for self-righteous people. And that goes for people that went from sandbox to sandbox looking for reality because anybody that doesn't think that they're in need of the blood of Jesus really doesn't understand how good the gospel really is, what the gospel is really all about. Is that correct? That's right. Yes. Now, we discussed these questions yesterday, so none of these are catching you off guard. How do we manifest that in small groups, and how do we have that trust in small groups? Well, you know, the big word there is trust, yeah. is trust. And as most of you know, um, small groups are normal and our heartbeat, mm -hmm. you know. We started small groups before we ever went on staff. And especially this past year, small groups mean a lot more because we haven't been able to meet like this. And, and meeting in a small group, you know, you... You learn, you learn to love each other as God loved them. You learn to respect one another. Um, you learn to respect their faults mm -hmm. and, and their good points. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I'm, I'm just thinking one of, our small, one of the small groups, Norm and I are in, there's some here that are in that small group. You know, we know more about each other's families than sometimes we do our own families. We pray for one another. You know, uh, we've all been there, you know, and... Uh, we know about their grandkids. We know it's just sharing life together. And that's what it's all about. It's sharing life's experiences. You know, in our small group, when somebody brings something up, usually another couple in that small group have been through that or another yeah. person. Yeah. And it's sharing that and helping them to grow. And in our small group, I get excited. I get excited when I hear somebody expressing something or even praying maybe they haven't prayed before yeah you know what an exciting time and that's where small groups we need small groups more and more right now than we ever have yeah because you know we can't see each other the way we used to hopefully 
That's coming soon. But in small groups, the walls are broken down. And another thing in small groups is trust. Yeah. And what is shared in small groups stays in small groups. Right. And it's very important. Very important. That's been one of your favorite sayings. It has been. What happens in small groups stays in small groups. I think you ripped that off from Las Vegas. <laughs> yeah, <Okay. probably. laughs> what happens in small groups stays in small groups but and I'm just kind of looking around I don't see anybody here that would remember there may be some that would remember when we first started small groups there was some pushback oh. because we heard from people saying I'm not going to trust my life how do I know they're not going to go out and tell somebody how do I know they're not going to go out and gossip and we spent a lot of pulpit time preaching on that value and how the church actually did meet in small groups. And how did we achieve that to, to build that level of trust? Because in, in my ministry here, you and I together for 22 years, I do not remember a single issue that we've had with trust being broken. No. No, I don't think we ever had. And you know... We had a teacher, but we, we, we mm -hmm. taught our we, we taught our small group leaders. You know, right. we called them shepherd leaders, and we taught them how, you know, that trust is very important. You have to build that trust, and you know, and it takes a while. Yeah, it takes a while to build trust. I remember, you know, sharing something in our small group, and I just shared just a little bit to see if that's where it stayed, and it did. It did, and that's what we in, in, tried to install in all of our small groups. Do a little bit out of, at a time, a little bit at a time. And don't be afraid to let your guard down. Don't I be think afraid the, to be yourself. Yeah, I think the way we approach that, and correct me if I'm wrong, we, we said when you visit a group or if you start a new group and you go to that new group, share something that's not going to hurt you. Just share something that's not going to hurt you and see if you hear that outside the group. That's right. And see if you hear anybody requesting prayer for that outside the group, <laughs> you know, because a lot of gossips, they love to pray about their gossip, you know? Yes. And so, and then if you don't, share something else that you would be a little more vulnerable about. Give it a couple of weeks and see. And what we're, we're saying, test us and see. Yes. Is that Exactly. Am I, am I getting yeah, that correct? Exactly. Yeah. And we also said... If you do violate this trust, we as a church will deal with you. We will take and, care of you. <laughs> yeah, we'll take care of that. All right. Now, COVID has changed. I mean, you and I just hugged each other. We haven't shaken hands in over a year. COVID has changed a lot. Did you know what Zoom was a little over a year ago? I always thought it was something I'd done in my car. <laughs> I had no idea what Zoom was. I have ridden with you. I can testify to that. <laughs> You like passing gear. Yes. <laughs> That's why they have it. <laughs> so how has COVID changed our small group ministry? Because for a while, you guys had to actually meet online. Yeah, a, lot of, a lot of the groups did. They met online. Um, and, uh, I mean, the first time we did it, um, we didn't have the slightest idea what we were doing. Everybody was talking at once. We couldn't hear everybody. And somebody would pop up here and somebody would pop up there. But after a while, you know, it... It got, at least we got to see each other, yeah. and we got to communicate with each other. And uh, I had no idea you could even do that, you know? But um, I'm, I'm still not sure how to do it. That's Pastor why Rick still uses a flip phone. He yes, refuses to use anything but a flip phone. So thank God for Norma. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank God for Norma. But, uh, but it's, it's been good. A lot of the groups did that, mm -hmm. you know? Now, now the, the groups are starting back up, but we're using social distancing. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if they've had their shots and everything, especially in our group, you know, we take the mask off. And um, um, our last small group, it was a little emotional, yeah. but it was just a good time of just getting together and seeing how everybody's doing. Sure. And, you know, asking how your grandkids are doing. How's your kids doing? How are, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. And that's important. How important for you? Now, I'm a part of three different small groups. You're a part of multiple small groups. How important is small groups to your health as a passionate follower of Christ? It's important because I know people are praying for me. Mm -hmm. When I share something, you know, especially uh, I have two different small groups that I'm in, actually three, and, uh, but I know that I can call them anytime, you know. I know that... Um, that they're praying for me, they're behind me, you know, 
And if I call and say, hey, you know, I need prayer in this area, I know they're going to go to prayer. Right. And that's so important just right. to know that. And we're not recommending that you be a part of multiple groups. That's not no. the point. We're, we, as a matter of fact, we don't even think that's no, healthy. No, get in, get in one group Yeah, and enjoy it. But one of my prayer partners called me this morning to pray for me before the service. That meant the world to me, you know. So it's, it's very important. So you're saying as a pastor and a leader, we need, we need small groups just as yes. much as anybody else yes, in the church do. does. Yeah. Is that correct? You're right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, let's change gears a little bit from small groups because, Rick, you're an outstanding leader. You were a leader at Chrysler before you ever came here, and um, you were a leader in this congregation. You were part of our board. Is leadership today, is it harder or easier than it was, let's just go back 20 years ago? I think it's harder. Okay. Um, because there, there's... there's it, the world has changed 100% mm -hmm. from 20 years ago. Right. And you have, to, you have to be strong, especially in today's world. A leader has to be strong. He can't bend, okay? He can't break. Right. And, um, and you're running up against things today as a leader that we never even thought of 20 years ago. Right. You know? And, uh, and you gotta be, you gotta be able to take that stand. And when people see that you're taking a stand and you're strong, then they'll, they'll be with you. Right. I had the opportunity this week to speak to a group of leaders, not Christian leaders, but a group of business and, and political leaders that I had the opportunity to speak to. Leadership is admittedly a challenging and a difficult role. But we're talking in particular here at Woodland about Christian leadership, and in our case in particular, pastoral leadership. Right. How, what differences do you see when you were a leader at Chrysler and you worked in a multi-ethnic factory? Yes, I did. Yeah, you did. You worked in a noisy, demanding place and the same needs that are present in this congregation were present at, at Chrysler. How do you see pastoral leadership in a church? You were a Christian leader. Everybody knew your faith. Right. There were some people that you've, you've told me some wonderful stories about that. that you tested me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How does pastoral leadership differ then? And I, and I think sometimes that's difficult for people to understand. It is. Um, you know, when I was a leader at Chrysler, you know, I had three or 400 different people working for me, and um, I was their boss. Mm -hmm. They may have not liked what I had to tell them to do, but they had to do it. Right. And, uh, but, you know, in my leadership there was a little bit different than even some of the leadership at the plant at that time, because I treated people as a human being. Right. And, uh, and I... And I got work done. Being a leader in a church, in a pastoral role, I'm not their boss. They're volunteers. Mm -hmm. You lead in love. Right. You lead, you know, Jesus said, follow me. And as we follow him, others will follow us. Right. And that's, that's the part of leadership in the church. And I think it's getting harder. Right. You know, people are questioning now. Before you could say, would you help me do this or would you like to do this? And they're questioning why. You know, never got that before. Yeah. Why? And, uh, and especially during this pandemic and other yeah. things going on. But leadership in the church, I think, in the pastoral role, is getting more difficult. Now, you had a metric at Chrysler. It was called a crank if I, yeah, yeah. and I still don't even know what it is, but <laughs> you've showed me before at the auto show, but your metric was a crank and it had to be milled in a certain way, if I remember correctly, yes. and do a certain thing. We have a metric at Woodland. It's called Passionate Followers of Christ. It sure is, Passionate Followers of Christ. But they're all different. I mean, look at this congregation this morning, beautiful congregation, and our, our camp, online campus, we have people watching from across the country. Right that uh, call this their church home. We're trying, to, we're trying to build passionate followers of Christ. How does that differ from Chrysler and what we're trying to do at Woodland Church? Well, it differs a lot because it's their life. Yeah. 
you know. At Chrysler, it was their job. Yeah. Here, it's not their job, it's their life. And you know, everybody is different. And you, you gotta use that different personality. Right. And, and help them to grow in that personality. There's no, there's no two people alike, you know? And you gotta realize that as a leader. You can't treat one, you know? There was some men at work that I could holler and scream at them. I didn't usually, but I could holler and scream at them to get them to do their job. There was others that all I had to do was tell them. There's others I had to buy them a cup of coffee. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So you treat everybody uh, with love, yeah. but to their personality, because not everybody grows at the same pace. This is true. Not everybody, you know, it took me 10 years to start growing, mm -hmm. you know, but once I realized who Christ was and what he, you know, so some zoom like mm -hmm. that and others, it's step by step by step. And you have to, you have to understand that and be patient. One of my mentors told me when I was in my 20s, I think I was like 28, 29, and I was so frustrated with my growth as a Christian and my growth as a Christian leader and as a pastor. I was pastoring a congregation and we were building a school and I was really frustrated with my growth. And so one of my mentors says, who is your role model? Who do you want to be like? So I told them. And I will never forget, they started laughing, not at me, but they started laughing. And they says, you cannot expect to be where he's at in his 60s and where you're at in your 20s. And that's one of the things that you've just been outstanding at. You're one of the most patient men I know. <laughs> <laughs> now, Norman, Dick Krug, Norman, don't laugh. <laughs> Dick Krug tells us never to pray for patience. <laughs> How do you maintain that patience with people? And Norma, I want to talk to you after the service, <laughs> okay? I need the other side. You know, sometimes it's hard. You, you know you can trust your wife because she's never told me that, and she, we worked together for years. We've had quite a test this last couple months getting ready to move. <laughs> okay. But no, you know, patience is, is something that I believe it never stops developing. Yeah. You know, it's a lot easier, I'm just being honest with you, it's a lot easier sometimes for us to be patient with strangers, to be patient with people in our congregation than it is to be patient with people at home. Right. And I've had to develop that, and I'm still working on it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, um, when somebody, you know, when somebody does something wrong in your congregation, you can just put your arm around and say, hey, you know, but... Uh, Patience is something that I believe when we get to heaven, we'll finally reach it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Norma, would you come and join us on the stage? Rick and Norma are going to pray for us this morning and have some closing words, and then we're going to pray for Rick and Norma today as well. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we thank you for this church. Lord, we thank you for your love and your grace and your peace that you have given us in this church through the blood of Jesus, through your grace, through your love. Lord, I pray that as we grow as a church, as we grow as individuals, our eyes will never cease to keep our eyes open on you. Our eyes will steadfast on you as we grow. So Lord, again, we just thank you for your love. And Lord, as you instructed Moses and Aaron, we now say to this church, may the Lord bless you and keep you, Amen. make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. 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 I want to ask you to stand. Rick, these are the friends of Rick and Norma. These are the friends of Rick and Norma, and there are many people watching online as well this morning. They're the friends of Rick and Norma. And today we want to pray for them and bless them. They're moving to Texas to be with 
I should start to say their grandchildren, but I guess I should include Kristen and Pastor Andrew in that as well, <laughs> you know. <laughs> They're moving to Texas to be close to their grandchildren, and the Bible says that fathers should teach their children's children as well. And this morning, as we extend our hands towards them, they'll be back to visit. You know, you, I'm just, just trust me, Norma. The wisdom you sent me about a Michigan winter, I'm going to tell you, a summer in the south, <laughs> honey, that's something you ain't never done before. So the mosquitoes down there just, you know, they haul you off before they eat you. So you, you're going to have a good time. So you'll be coming back for the godliest summer I know of, and that's here in Michigan. But we want to pray for them. And then after we bless them, I'm going to ask you to keep your heads bowed as I invite people to commit their lives to Jesus Christ because this has not been just about Rick and Norma. This has been about what Jesus has done in our lives and everything that he shared with you in his wisdom and I shared with you about the ministry this morning. It's Christ who makes that forgiveness. It's Christ who makes that new grace. It's that Christ that helps you to lead across denominational, racial, gender lines. It's Christ that makes all of that possible. And I admit, we as a church have not always been the best model of that. But we are really trying as we pursue Christ with everything in our hearts and as we love one another with all of our hearts to be passionate followers of Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to be asking you to pray with me and to commit your life to Jesus. And if you're in this room this morning, you've never given your life to Jesus you can pray that prayer as well and have a brand new, fresh start in your life. So would you bow your heads and would you extend your hands towards Rick and Norma right now? Father, in the precious and the holy name of Jesus, I thank you for my brother and his wife. I thank you for my friends. I thank you, Lord, for the call of God that you put upon their life, a call that, Lord, you never did change your mind about. I thank you, Lord, this morning that they were the kind of people that they bore fruit long before they ever became a part of a church staff. God, we knew they were pastors because of the fruit of their ministry and their lives in this congregation. And so now, in the name of Jesus, as we send them forth, we commend them to your love, we commend them to your protection, and we commend them to your care and your provision, never to be forgotten by this body, Lord, and always knowing that if there's ever a need in their life, they can call this congregation their small groups, and Lord, we will be there. This we pledge for before you. We will be there, not only for them, but for their daughters and for their grandchildren. Father, this we pray in Jesus' name. Father, I pray for Norma. Lord, she has been to this body an example of what you said a godly woman should be. Father, she Amen. has been a mentor. She has been, Lord, one who reached out to the hurting. She has been there when she's been needed around the clock. Mm -hmm. And Father, I pray that as you take them to not just a new place to live, but Father, you are Hallelujah. taking them to a new field. Mm -hmm. Father, I pray there will be fruitfulness, there will be abundance, and Father, that you will be a blessing in the lives to those that will come into their life, Lord, now as they start on a God. new journey. Father, not an end, but Lord, a time of something brand new in your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise for the Sutherlands this morning. I love you, buddy. I love you so much. You can be seated. You can be seated as well this morning. Before I invite you to give your heart to Christ this morning, I want to tell you something. I don't care who you are, what you've done, where you're from. Someone just recently told me, they says, God could never forgive me. And when they went through what all had happened in their life, you know, 
I'll be honest with you, the thought crossed my mind, wow, this is one of the most horrible stories I've ever heard. But the grace of God is this, whatever we have done, all of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. Their sin was no greater than my sin. The consequences of pain and hurt to others might have been, but their sin was no greater than my sin. We've said it for the last few weeks. We all carry the nails of Christ's crucifixion in our pockets. So I'm going to ask you, would you trust him? Would you trust him because you need a savior, you need a friend, and one day, you and I, we're both going to stand together before the Lord. And he'll either look at us through what Christ has done at Calvary or what we've tried to do for ourselves. And I don't know about you, I need what Jesus did for me. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for our friends in the sanctuary and our friends online as well this morning. Would you cause the message of the gospel that Christ came into the world to save people like them and me, the chief of sinners, Lord. And as much as we know how, Lord, we, we just step across that line and say, Lord, here I am. I belong to you. Forgive me of my sins. So why don't you pray something just like this? Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Christ. Thank you for loving me. And I ask you in Jesus' name to forgive me of all my sins and give me a fresh start in life. For it's in your name I pray. Amen, amen, and amen. And if you'll email me right here at Woodland, I've got something I'd love to see you. I want you to know what we do on this earth matters in heaven. If you just prayed that prayer, all of heaven is rejoicing. Heaven is having a party because of what you just did to give your heart to Christ. Nobody will be knocking on your door. Nobody will be adding you to a mail, mailing list unless you want to be. But email us right here at Woodland and let us be a friend to you and help you get started in your new life today. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise for those that have committed their lives to Christ today. Hallelujah. Now, <clears throat> you want to come back and watch this later online because after the second service, Pastor Rick and I are going to be doing a, a brief interview to cover some things we weren't able to cover this morning. It will be posted following the service. Hi, family. We want to wrap this up. We had a great day today. Yes, we, we did. Wasn't that it fun? Was, it was fun. Yeah. It really was. Matter of fact, I wish we'd have done this more often. Yeah, we, we should have. It's a lot easier on me. It's a little more challenging for you. It's challenging. <laughs> <laughs> it's been good. It's, it's been great. We had two wonderful services today, people saying goodbye to Pastor Rick and Norma. You're retiring and moving to Texas. Why Texas? Well, number one. Grandkids. <laughs> okay, I understand. <laughs> my great, my grandsons are down there, and my youngest daughter and husband are down there, and uh, they've been down there for eight years, yep. and we're going to go down there and just enjoy them. Now, you already have a great church to be a part of because your son-in-law is on staff at a great church. Tell us about that church. Yeah, he, he's on staff at... Um, Gateway. Gateway Church, and they've just started a new branch, and he's in that, and it's growing. He's the uh, worship leader there, and we've met some people that we already know the pastor at that at that yeah. local one. So it'll be challenged because we don't know very many right. people, but just getting, it's going to be something fresh, something new. Well, you know, one of the challenges that we've had as a congregation is when our people move away is finding a new church to go to. We get calls all the time saying, I'm trying to find a woodland. Now, Gateway is not a woodland, and woodland is not a gateway. So what advice would you give to people about finding a new church? You know, um, you're not going to find another woodland, mm -hmm. okay? But just find one where you know, where you feel comfortable, and you know they're preaching the Word of God. Yeah. And, and they don't waver back and forth. They, they stand on the word. Yeah. That's the most important thing. Yeah. I have a question. Would you still choose Gateway, you think, if your son-in-law wasn't there? Or do you think you would be like some of our other folks were, trying out multiple churches? You know, I would probably choose Gateway. Yeah. Um, because Robert Morse is on TV. And uh, they, they don't waver. 
Yeah. You know, they make a stand and that's yeah. what it is. And uh, they're very strong on that. I think that's important to know that he's just not choosing the church because his son-in-law is on staff there. And I could understand that if you did, but uh, you've, you've already had experience with watching that pastor's ministry right. on television. You know what they stand for in their ministry, but it doesn't hurt that your grandson. No, it doesn't hurt at all. <laughs> <laughs> and my grandson works at one of them too. So. Oh, does he really? Yeah, what Ethan does he does. do? Ethan runs the uh, the cameras and stuff in the kid zone. I knew that. I shouldn't have acted like I didn't. I did know that. That's good. Rick, we have we have worked together for 22 years as as pastors on the staff together, and you're one of my very best friends, if, if not my best friend, you know, here in Michigan. But it's because. We have, we have been co-laborers together in Christ. Yes, we have. And we have shared, you know, some of the greatest joys in life, and yep. we've shared some of the greatest sorrows in life. But we talked about just a few moments ago, you and I are totally opposite. One of the other things we didn't talk about is you love camping and I don't. Yes. Yeah, camping is uh, camping's on my list of the ten. Yeah. It's, it's probably about four or five. Yeah. <laughs> I think the children of Israel probably love camping. They spent a long they, time, they spent a long time <laughs> doing that. They probably didn't have the nicest campers I did. But <laughs> no, they probably didn't have as nice a campers you did. But they did enjoy camping. One of the things that I love about the story of the children of Israel in the wilderness is how that when they followed the cloud by day, the cloud being the Shekinah glory of God, and the fire by night being the, the presence of the Lord, they were safe. One of the things that we've always wanted is a Spirit-led ministry, a Holy Spirit-led ministry, and we know He leads us through His Word. Can you talk to us about trusting the Holy Spirit in ministry? Yeah, you know, um, Pastor, I can go all the way back to when you asked me to come on staff, Right. you know, and I thought, you're kidding me, you know? (laughs) Uh, I I just got done being a deacon, and and I was going off the board, and uh, I said, Lord, you know, this is you. Yeah. It's not me. If you want me to, you open up the doors. If you don't want me, you close. And that's the leading. Right. You know? And the doors just kept opening and opening. And if you remember, uh, I told you I couldn't, I couldn't go on. I was only 55, and I couldn't go on until I was 62 because, you know, I couldn't retire till then. Yeah. And you said you would pray about it. And two weeks later, they offered me an early out. <laughs> so that's the leading of the Holy God Spirit. God answers prayer. Yes, he does. I tell people all the time, if you don't want an answer, don't ask us to pray. And don't you pray, because God answers prayer. Isn't that true? He does. And God made a way. We've had a lot of fun doing ministry together. And can you think of specific times other than that that God has led Norma in you? That maybe you're famous for your great stories. The story you could tell us? Yeah, you know, um, she, uh, Norma's, Norma's a tremendous, she backed me in everything, yeah. you know. And I would have never went on staff if it wasn't, you know, if she wouldn't have said, no, we can't do it. Yeah. But uh, there's been different ministries where we ha- have a chance to sit down and, especially in marriage, uh, help different marriage right. couples who are struggling in different areas and uh, and teaching them some of our especially some of our younger mm-hmm. couples and uh, and teaching them how to give and how to take yeah. you yeah. know and and how to put God in in their marriage right. so that's been one area another area is just uh, just teaching people and watching them grow and and uh, one of the one of the men in the first service came and gave me a, a big hug and and, uh, and I, I, I told him, I said, you have grown so much in the five or six years, you know, and just tears in his eyes. And it's things like that. That's the leading of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And those are exciting things. You know, I was a little concerned in the first service. <clears throat> I think we actually went over what the limit that we're allowed to, to have here. We had a pretty good group. We had a good crowd here this morning. But people love Norma and you. They wanted to be here. And there were still people watching online as well in, in both services. And, Rick, did you ever dream that God would give you as much influence in ministry as he's given you these last 22 years? Never. Yeah. You know, Pastor, when, uh, when I came back to the Lord and, you know, and, and I became a Sunday school superintendent or a Sunday school teacher, then superintendent, and little things like that, you know. And then when they asked me to be an elder at a church, I was only 28 years old. Yeah. You know, and I thought, are you kidding me? You know, but God just kept opening up the doors. And you know, 
It's that having that relationship with God, because I never wanted to get out of, I didn't want to be a bull and run and get out of his, yeah. out of his will, yeah. you know, but as he opened them up, uh, you know, we walked through them, right. you know, and it's, it's been great. It has been great. It's been great. It's been a lot of fun. Well, we got to wrap this up because we've got, this is tagged on to the right. end of the service, but God has been good to us, been good to us through you and through Norma. Something funny happened in the first service, though. I did not expect. Do you know what I'm talking about? I said that you were one of the most patient people that I knew, <laughs> and your wife started chortling on the front row. I'm, I am patient except standing in line. Okay. Or especially standing in line at a grocery store or something like that. Yeah. Or in a fast food place where people don't have any idea what they're doing. <laughs> in front of me. You know, um, and Norma, Norma works on my patience with that. We have only watched a couple of ball games together in the 22 years I've been yeah. here. Um, you were even patient. I don't know if it's because I was sitting there and you didn't know me real well at first, but I only remember, I don't even remember you. I holler during the football games. I mean, I am known for going stupid, stupid, stupid. I do too. Do you really? I was trying to be nice. <laughs> You're making me feel better about myself now because I've always told Becky, Rick never gets upset watching the ball game. Well, Norma, Norma usually says, you know, if they can't coach it, why don't you just take over coaching? <laughs> well, you could do a good job. Don't you agree? Yeah, you could do it. Now, I have never been able to convince you to come to the light side, and that is to be a Georgia Bulldogs fan. No, I'm a, I'm a Wolverine fan and, and, uh, and a little bit Michigan State because of Rocky. Yeah, yeah. You know? But, uh, no, I'm a Wolverine and Tiger fan. You know, yeah, <laughs> let's, let's don't talk about that, okay? You know, I will always be a loyal Georgia Bulldogs fan and especially to the, to the Falcons and the Braves. But Rocky got the last word on us. Before the year he died, I believe, Michigan State beat Georgia. Michigan State beat Michigan. Michigan. He went to heaven with a smile on his he face. He did. He went to heaven with a smile on his face. And he's probably up to saying, yep, I did it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Rick, I love you. Thanks so much for doing ministry with me. Thank you for being my friend and my co-laborer in Christ. And I've said this many, many times. I mean it from the bottom of my heart. You are a far greater pastor than I am. You have incredible and amazing pastoral skills and Woodland Church has been so fortunate to have you as a part of this team. Well thank you Pastor and then let me just say you have taught me so much. I thought when I went on staff I knew a lot but you have taught me so much how to be a pastor and I appreciate that. I love you so much. God bless love you. you. And thank you so much for watching today. Be sure that you, um, you send a message to Pastor Rick and Norma and let them know how much you love them. God bless you.